Right, well, good evening. I'm Simon Lovesey, the founder of Restart Sailing, joined by John Emmett, I think, uh, in somewhere sunny. I think. Yes, uh, very, very lucky to uh, be able to continue um, coaching and uh, really looking forward to um, talking to Ian later on in the show. Good, okay. So the Facebook group's been uh, busy again. I think uh, a bit of a saga, wasn't there, over old vaccines? <laughs> It's, uh... Yeah, well, there's there's lots of news coming in uh, at the moment, and actually the news that came uh, straight uh, today was was about the Olympics. So we can carry carry on that later. But uh, it looks uh, like some of the senior members, the president, is absolutely determined that the event is going to take place. Okay, but it's uh, interesting. Yeah, the Facebook group sort of lights up and then sort of dulls down a bit. <laughs> Different things happen, and uh, I guess it's going to be. Uh, a similar story over the coming weeks as we try and find out what's what's sort of happening so uh, obviously uh, quite a lot of going on and videos we're doing John yeah so uh, internet permitting uh, the idea is now that we have a regular slot for the uh, YouTube uh, so for people who can't for whatever reason make the Facebook live uh, the YouTube will go on the uh, Johnny Mitt sailing channel at nine o'clock on the Thursday evening so um, hopefully that's good good for most people and I will try and watch that so any questions we can try and answer them live as well yeah so uh, back to our old three stages amazing how it was almost a year ago that we put this together John wasn't it 20 23rd of March off the top of my head was my first yeah yeah and uh, first lockdown I probably should have fact checked that before the show but uh, the, the, the timeline is holding up well from the uh, the aggressive as the Americans called it social distancing through to the uh, limited social distancing, but I think we've, we've seen all ranges, haven't we, over the last uh, 10 months or so? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And if you look in the wider picture, you see, you know, different countries going in and out. And if you look at the narrower picture, you see different regions in the UK going in and out. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we can see the light in the end of the tunnel, uh, maybe around May. And I do, I do wonder if the UK will be one of the best places to be uh, Covid-wise, come September, but we we have to see how things go. Yes, but uh, I think a good amount of uh, grassroots sailing happening last year. I think that perhaps well, I think that was one of the things which really came out from the group. Restart sailing is obviously helping the people restart sailing during a pandemic, but it's also very much about restarting grassroots sailing, encouraging club level, and, and where do we go from? Um, from here yeah but it's definitely been encouraging local sailing which is perhaps a, a good thing isn't it <laughs> yeah so you mentioned the uh, the olympics i think that's been in the uh, the news again today and I, I see there's a big ioc press conference next week yes yeah every time we uh, work out the date of the show we find something else comes up but uh, yeah there, there was a the normal um situation is sort of march time with um Japan and then obviously there was the second wave in June uh, which is why we couldn't have the Olympics last year I guess it's open to debate whether it's still a second wave or we're in a you know yeah, in a big third wave but I think the problem is at the moment the population are quite worried uh, so actually the Japanese population are not necessarily that keen to host whereas for the whole Olympic les legacy it would Oh, seems to have lost you, John. Okay, hopefully John will come back again. So uh, let's sort of uh, carry on move. Oh, John, you back there? <laughs> as far ah. as I'm concerned, oh, I never went away. We, we, we lost you there, John. <laughs> so I, think so I always have to backtrack. Uh, this is one of the joys of not being home with the um, with the internet. So that I think the Japanese populace are very worried from a public health point of view. But uh, in terms of the link, Olympic movement, it would be you know a tragedy if the event didn't happen. And I hope for those people at home who've had a very difficult year or even two years. You know, the Olympics is something to celebrate and, and sit and watch and enjoy, even if it's just um, from the TV at home. And I think some of the ways that the UK is going to get out of this pandemic uh, are true for the for the global side of things as well. Yes. And I think elite sport has shown that it can go ahead. You know, we, we've seen the football and the cricket has been very successful, hasn't it? 
Yeah, so there's a trickle down from elite sports. So in terms of international sport, uh, we see that to, to go to nearly every country now, you need to have a negative PCR test. So you're in an airport full of people with negative PCR tests and you're on a plane with people with negative PCR tests. And this, this has allowed some uh, travel to go on. And then obviously when people are at events, they need to be very careful with face masks, social distancing, washing hands and, and just all the precautions that I think we're very, very aware of now. Yeah. And I guess the next step um, is going to be associated with the vaccine rollout. So when you have your vaccine, uh, my mum and auntie were uh, vaccinated this week and uh, my cousins actually work in the health service. So some of them have had their um, second vaccine almost two weeks ago now, I guess. So you, you get a bit of paper to say you've had a vaccine and I think some sort of uh, certification uh, is probably the way forward. I think uh, Saga Cruises announced that today. Uh, you need that to be able to join the cruises and it will take time to roll these things out, but maybe just a, a stamp in your passport type thing will, will ease uh, movement back sooner rather than later. And I yeah. say the vaccine clearly the way out of the pandemic uh, we, we could see that unusual situation of uh, some people being released and others not couldn't we <laughs> maybe the over 70s are going to dominate sport for the first uh, six weeks because they're the ones with the vaccines <laughs> yeah yeah well that's right and that's, that's people have been saying that the uh uh, they'll be picking up all the trophies and everything. It uh, could be quite a lot. In, in all seriousness, I mean, the order they've done the vaccines sounds very sensible to me. Um, so I think at the moment, uh, the UK is really suffering terribly, um, but we're leading the charge on the vaccine. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the message from our sort of restart sailing is pretty much stay at home, isn't it? I think in terms of uh, yeah. uh, not, not much can sort of go ahead. Yeah, but, we're over the halfway point, if you think, you know, this all started back in March. We, we've got the light in the end of the tunnel. Just uh, what we do now will make a huge difference to, um, you know, the, the, the friends and family who are still with us and in good health in six months time. Yeah, yeah. As, as you say, so hopefully a light at the end of the tunnel and the, the, the vaccine, I think, yeah, that, that is a success story definitely, isn't it? Right. We got still John there, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. I was, I was thinking, was this uh, was this the next slide? <laughs> yeah, it's but, um, back to reality. We're going to be focusing on trade now, and uh, sadly today, a couple of quite significant cancellations have sort of come in. The uh, the big German boat show that actually moved, I think, from January to April, they've now decided that that's going to be. Uh, uh, it for this year and uh, basically into 2022 now. Uh, so that's. Hello, uh, I, I saw in terms of sailing events, I think uh, Kiel looks like uh, it will run. And Kiel was one of the best put together regattas I saw in 2020. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's there, there was some good experience gained, wasn't there, last year in terms of sort of COVID? They security. set the bar very high. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, then, uh, unfortunately, Glastonbury <laughs> gone as well. And, uh, yeah, two years in a row now. Yeah, um, and again, you know, these big sort of events, you know, struggling. So I think that has a sort of a sets a bit of a tone, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it to me, you know, it's always sad, but at the same time, very expected. And uh, I think just by being aware of the situation probably helps people's mental health. I mean, I think it's just amazing how quickly the vaccine has come out. But I have um, friends who are actually involved in the process and it's just as thorough now as any other vaccine uh, that has, has come out in in the past. And, you know, yeah. if there's any red flags or whatever, the, the vaccines don't get passed. Yeah, yeah. So and it's it's amazing what reason. normally takes eight years. They yeah, condensed into eight months, haven't they? But, uh, yeah, well, they've just worked incredibly hard. I mean, it's I think it's like knitting a scarf. If you work on a scarf on your own, yeah. uh, you know, however um, hard you try, it's going to take you a certain length of time to, to produce the scarf. But if you've got lots of friends, you can start at different stages of the scarf, but you need to be very careful uh, that it knits together. And I think that's where the progress have been, that they've been able to do um, various stages um, or phases, I guess the word is, simultaneously. Yeah, it's well, uh, as, you, as you say, a lot of knitting, but uh, but apparently the normal eight years, a lot of it is the red tape and so forth. And I think that's what they've 
Condensed. But I think everybody's dropped everything to, to do it. I mean, and there's lots of different types of virus, uh, sorry, a vaccine. You know, some of them are, if you like, a weaker type of the virus. Some of them are, are just a, a part of the virus, but they're all just teaching your, your body how to produce the antibodies you need. Because what we found is even a very, very small dose of the actual virus could be deadly to some people. And it's it's actually surprising to me sometimes some of the people who got um, uh, got worst uh, effect. I was just so good to talk to uh, Nick on a previous show. If people haven't seen that, um, to hear his story and a and a few words of wisdom there. That was, that was one of our best shows, I think. Yeah, the, the, the long COVID. Right. Okay. So uh, moving on to our guest, Ian. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for here. joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon and John, it's a pleasure to be here. I haven't followed you quite uh, openly with uh, Facebook and all your uh, efforts. Um, I think we've probably been as busy as each other on, uh, yeah, on yeah. social media. And it's been good to see you you're doing a lot of comments on some of that in a minute in terms of the support you've been giving to the trade. And I think uh, we'll look at some of the numbers, but the, the trade is important for us going sailing. And even if it's in our little laser dinghy we still got the trade behind us the boat builders and the sail makers and the, the coaches as well let's not forget the coaches but uh, there's a whole I'm ecosystem that. <laughs> that, uh, i've got to say it's a bit of a shot that we've we've done 20 odd 20 odd shows already um but yeah. it just shows time does pass and i think you know it's trying to show we, we've been looking at class associations and sailors but it all there is this big army of people behind it making our sport work and the trade is a part of it so Ian, you're, you're the chair of the, the the professional charter association aren't you? that's yeah. correct i took over about six years ago on that role um same time uh, just before that i was uh, voted in as a director there are three directors a little bit of history for myself or for anyone else is um my upbringing is sailing racing dinghies um, all the way from about the age of seven, as you can probably see from my horrible photograph. Um, I've been around quite a long time uh, around the uh, boating industry and sailing and racing nationally. Yeah, and what was fascinating here, we did the Bloody Mary history as part of the Seldon Sail Juice, and you, you, you had some connection to that, didn't you? <laughs> I, I did indeed. Uh, my father, God bless him, he's still, um, he's still around but not sailing um, in his 90s. And he was part and parcel of the uh, Ali Pali meeting where we were trying to promote mm -hmm. Queen Mary when it first started. And I, as a kid, was stood in front handing out leaflets yeah. telling how wonderful it would be. Yeah. I've always amazing, as we were saying earlier, how Queen Mary came about as a collaboration between all the all the local competing clubs and, and the RWA actually underwriting it. I think it was uh, quite quite innovative in terms of the, the structure of that one. Yeah, it was, it was good to see. When I look back at it now, I realise a lot of the river clubs cancelled their sailing during winter months, went across the gravel pits, uh, all to reservoirs. And then Queen Mary came in on the back of that, really, with uh, the efforts that were made by quite a few people at that time. Yeah, good to see. And I guess, in a way, you're, the Charter Association is a sort of that collaboration, isn't it? It, it is. We've got a very wide uh, mix of people. It started in 1991 with skippers and owners uh, going back across yachts, cruisers, and then more lately, the ribs have really taken off uh, in so much as the, the number game. Um, but all of them are working closely with each other. Um, so it, it started in 91. We reformed again uh, under one of the certifying authorities for the licensing of vessels to be used commercially. Um, and then in 2014, we opened up into a limited company, so we've got more control on what we were doing as a group, uh, looking after the members. Yes. But you, you see a trend towards power then, is that the sort of uh, observation? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I still think I've got probably more members who are power cruisers and ribs than I have yachts, but the yacht companies um, tend to be multi-yacht owners. Um, we don't get, we get individual rib operators, but we then get uh, someone like Hamble Point Yacht Charters who run a, a fleet of yachts and uh, other companies down at Portsmouth to say. Um, and so they have a larger number. So numbers wise, the boats are probably similar. Yeah, yeah. And you, you personally are chartering ribs, I think, for those who might be interested. I do, yeah. I've been running them since uh, 2002, let me think, 10, I think. Yeah, 2010, um, running my own business. Um, and this last year's um, opened your eyes on what needed to be done. I think my time in my shed out here, which is my office, yeah. It's been sent working with the P on the PCA issue. Yeah. Uh, it's been 
It's, it's certainly chartering ribs, it, um, John, is a big, big, big business in the Olympic circles, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the logistics are a bit of a nightmare. Um, and yeah, certainly for some teams, we've we've done an awful lot of chartering. And um, it's, it's an absolutely necessity with the Olympics. Everybody has to be towed out to the, um, to the race course or we would never make the racing schedule. Yeah. But it's amazing when you go to some of these big events, how many ribs you see, you can't, uh, can't walk on water, can you, anymore? No, well, I think that's probably the main limiting factor for the, for the number of teams in some venues, um, when they have to limit the capacity of the event. Yeah, yeah. interesting, of course. So, uh, just sort of moving on, so the, we were talking earlier about Ian, that how, how big this industry is. I mean, uh, this is some British marine figures. I mean, it, it includes everyone, but some staggering numbers, aren't they? <laughs> there are indeed. I mean, I look across the whole industry and having sat through quite a few of the uh, British Marine and uh, uh, MCA meetings with across the board with other associations, you get to realise how wide it is from work boats through to um, just a leisure cruiser to the leisure yachts that is then used for people chartering, uh, boat builders who are supplying and all the equipment supplies. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah, you know, four, four billion. Now, okay, there's a few super yachts in there, but amazingly, in, well, this, this is 2019 figures, 10,000 new built boats were built. Now, they can't be 10,000 super yachts, can they? <laughs> No, but they're still coming out the door. If you look at the uh, launches we keep seeing online of the uh, super yachts, and the, that's then crews. Um, so you've got all the marine crews that run with them who are all professionals. They're all trained either by the RYA or by similar organisations. Yeah, it it's, it's really is a big industry when you, when you look at it and uh, how it counts. So I think um, just sort of... a. Thinking, you know, we've got some things out, but you know, what are the impacts you've been seeing in your... In your... I mean, I suppose the biggest thing for us is uh, starting March last year, um, very bumpy ride, um, a notice straight away to every one of our industry um, charter boats we had to close down. There were slight exceptions. Some of the companies that were running work boats were still able to operate by running out to the... Um, uh, offshore works uh, where passengers were needed to be transported and likewise we were still allowed to do odd jobs uh, which related to the film industry, BBC and media, um, uh, believe it or not, ashes and burials at sea were still allowed uh, and they're still allowed now in this lockdown okay. so it's quite broad but yeah it closed our industry down um, massive hit for us on income obviously our season in the UK tends to be from about March through to about October and of course we closed down March to July when we expect to be taking the bookings um, and then during that time I spent my time just going daily through all the government guidelines and rules yes. and then started working on the grants um, yeah. and support to the industry and our, our members if you like. Yeah well we'll come on to that maybe. So out of interest, are the lockdown, the guidelines now different, are they, in, in three to one? Are we? Um, no, for us, it's been the same, um, exactly the same. We're, uh, we've seen other industries that remained open this time in lockdown three, whereas in the first lockdown, they were closed. Uh, but we as charter vessels, uh, hire boats, passenger vessels aren't allowed to operate. Um, ours opened up in July last year, um, and I foresee, looking forward, that probably the way we'll go again with opening up to the industry with restrictions again. Yeah, I think there's some precedence there, isn't there, and uh, how, how that will go. And there's also been some support around, I know you've sort of, uh, been quite active in that, uh, in terms of what, what's the sort of uh, help that people have been getting? The, the, the main issues have been um, grants or bank loans, um, self-employed uh, allowances, Limited companies suffered badly um, where they were taking, um, um, not payments, but uh, uh, what do you call them, directors' uh, payments as opposed to a, a salary. Uh, that left, well, in the UK, about 3 million un unemployed, well, sorry, wrong, unemployed uh, directors <laughs> who weren't receiving any support, and that still continues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a big Facebook group, I think you're involved in that as well, in terms of the excluded group. It's so, so that's right. We've been group. following that and trying to help out with our knowledge of what we've seen with the grants, because the grants went from prison premises, and obviously, as you're probably aware, a lot of our businesses run from offices like mine, which are not rateable value. 
Um, so you've then got an issue where we can't claim the grants. Uh, we can claim bank loans, uh, which are then repayable. But if you're not earning an income, how do those businesses then repay them? Yeah, I think that's been, as we said, the, the, the biggest issue of the marine sector is, you know, yeah. We, we don't necessarily work in an office. My, my office is a committee boat or a rib or whatever. But that doesn't have a rateable value much, does it? <laughs> Perhaps it should. No, it's the same as I said to you earlier in relation to, you know, there could be a 60-foot princess or a sun seeker that is someone's office at yeah. the same time as being their business. Um, and they'll run exactly as we are here in an office. Um, they're running their business in the same way there through mobile phones and uh, internet bookings. Yeah, it, and it, it seems pity that yeah the, the policy makers haven't caught up with the modern way of doing business, have they? I've had I've had a few conversations with them, and they they, they don't understand it. They think you should be in a physical office. Really. Yeah, I think that's been one of the biggest issues. Um, we've certainly written quite a few letters to government departments, um, covering everything from their committees that were reviewing payments and grants. Um, we, we, we were allowed to write to them. I don't know if that's the right word. We were asked to write to them. Um, we've had some feedback that's been positive. I think the grants were more positive eventually. There was a lot of fighting to be done. But as I said to you earlier, as an example, the Isle of Wight I consider to be a very effective marine um, industry base and the Isle of Wight local authority were appalling for industry in the Marines, or uh, the marine industry. Uh, you know, we were having to write to them and saying, come on, this is what the legislation says. You know, it was the marine industries, it was a leisure industry, uh, and all, all, all linked with that. But they, at the start, were pretty poor. Yeah, yeah. But I think, as we've seen around here on the South Coast, they have been changing. I think they're sort of... Yeah. But they're realising what the word discretionary means, I think, now. That, uh, they, they, they've yeah, got a bit, a bit of power. I think you had to remind them it wasn't their money. It was government money that you know, should be paid out. And the last thing we want to see is local authorities giving back that money to the, to the government. Well, it? that's right. And we, we've seen it there. But certainly in the last round, they'd be more prove that you've actually lost money you know, and we'll help you out really. I think it's been a more sort of rather than prove you have an office. Yeah, and it was very much about that. And even now they're talking about uh, identifying what your normal income would be. Um, I'm still waiting now on the latest discretionary grants for this latest lockdown. Come on, the government have already released the information and uh, apparently the money. The local authority haven't actually their uh, packages yet. Yeah, yeah. So uh, hopefully, yeah, and some good work you're doing. And uh, we've all obviously had to make lots of changes, haven't we? You know, become COVID secure. We've seen that at sailing events. You know, clubs are having yeah. to spend money, and I guess that's the same in the, in your your part of the world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, certainly. The I mean, I suppose um, looking at the marine charter boats and hire boats, we were then looking at whether it was a hire boat going out for a leisure trip, because that was slightly different from a hire boat taken out with a qualified skipper, um, the hire boats could go out a lot earlier because it was a leisure trip. We then had to manage the handovers of the boats in a COVID secure way to someone who's qualified, but they're obviously, they're taking their family out on the boat. So that was the first port of call when we opened up in, I think the end of, no, middle of June, I'm guessing that some of the companies could get their boats out. Because it was, was it bare boat scar charter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it was so bare, bare boat first, yeah. Yeah, it was a bare boat option. We had a few conversations. A few became a little bit worried about that um, because of the social distancing involved. But if you could get the boat out uh, with the families, with their groups that were, you know, their bubbles as they were, um, then providing you handed over in a COVID secure way, then we were quite comfortable supporting them. And when we produced loads of documentation for them and advice documents and also quite a few um, legislation documents so if they ever got challenged they could say they were following those guidelines yeah and i think that's gonna hold us in good stead isn't it you know <laughs> in, in a, in yeah i mean I, i've gone through everything and asked the industry since we've had our um, annual meeting online again and we can't place one single um, infection or virus hit on any charter vessel trip. And now if I can say that again and again, that's got to help the industry. Well, yes, and I think we, we need to get that message over because certainly for sailing events, yeah. I mean, John, John's seen some of that, but there's been COVID outbreaks, but that's to be expected, isn't it, in terms of the numbers? 
Yeah. But I think, John, I'm right in saying there hasn't really been evidence of lots of transmission going on, has there? No, well, I think, you know, we're very lucky that it's an outdoor sport and an outdoor environment. We get rigged and changed outdoors, yeah. especially at the, the warmer the warmer venues. Uh, and people, once they're competing, you know, it's it's hard to imagine a better ventilated area than, you know, 20 knots in, a, in, in your boat. Um, yeah. I think probably the, the difficulty for hosting events now is more more about the travel. Once people actually get there, I think we're very aware of the procedures that have to be in place. Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think there's some good procedures we put in place and good evidence to show that. I think, I think we perhaps need to be shouting a bit more about that, you know, making the policymakers realise that. Well, I figure I might be a good advert if I end up with a, um, with a tan line from wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can see I'll be wearing it properly. But, uh, You've been on holiday we'll, again. <laughs> yes. We'll see how that looks in March. Yeah, yeah. but I know other industries, the you know, the nightclubs even, have been making some strong cases, haven't they, that they're, they're COVID secure. You know? <laughs> yeah, for me, not. I don't. <laughs> I can't see how they can do that. But uh, yeah, but uh, the, that's the, not something that interests me so much. I think you know the point is the people who know the industries really well should be the people that help put the plans together. Well, I, I think, think that's right. He's done a very good job. It's that delegation, isn't it? It's you know the, the the people who understand their industry should be the ones putting the rules together. And I think that's. I mean, I don't know if that's your experience here. I think in a way that's been happening, hasn't it? It has. I mean, we've had quite a lot of um, uh, meetings, online meetings with British Marine, um, who were obviously trying to get the restart going. Um, it was very similar to what you were doing on the restart sailing. We were doing restart um, marine businesses, and I think everyone was picking up the best ideas from different people uh, all the way through to the COVID secure documentation or posters we were putting out. I mean, we saw the writing on the wall, it was two meters originally, what is it gonna be in the future? So we just produced documentation for the, um, the members that said, you know, keep your distance dictated by present legislation. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we were saving money by helping out, but it meant that our members in that case were able to, to build a good platform to work from safely and guarantee that, well, I say guarantee as best you can, that we were safe from the virus whilst out in the water. It was only the issue of arrival at marinas, at locations, onto the boat. But once you're moving in the fresh air, as John just said, yeah. um, I mean, we, we trialled um, face masks at speed <laughs> and we decided it was better actually just face masks in the marinas yeah. um, and then it was down to each operation after that to work through that. Yeah and I, th I think some good practice has come out and I think that's gonna gonna really get us going quickly you know as and when those those releases happen. <laughs> right so I think possibly there is a positive look to the future isn't there Ian in terms of I think we've we've seen a booming activity I think as we were saying. Earlier. Yeah I, I think when you look at what's happened over the last year for the industry um, the majority of our people have been saying there has been a real uptake of UK-based operations. Now, if you're talking about just taking a hire boat out, a charter vessel, or buying a boat to get out in the water with your family, the brokers have been struggling to get the right type and number of boats to sell because everyone appeared to have a considerable amount of finance behind them. Um, where they would have spent that going abroad. And when you heard the, the fees they were paying, I, I haven't got a young family. <laughs> the cost to take a young family abroad, they were spending that money on you know, boats and not even blinking. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was talking to John at uh, RS recently and he said, yeah, that they've had a, you know one of their best years, really, because uh, people have been at home. They've perhaps had a bit more money in their pocket and uh, you know a new boat has been uh, uh, up there on the list. <laughs> Especially yeah. a single hander, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, lots of arrows and things like that. So, uh, yeah, they're there for love, love and money, I think. But uh, so, yeah, I think it's, in a way, it's, it's it's helped the industry, hasn't it? I think the challenge now is turning that into something sustainable as everything else starts to come back, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that's the biggest issue: is making sure that as we're able to open up and start working again, that we're we we're in a position where we can offer what people are looking for. Uh, and that's what that, you know, this last year, it was very much family events or two family events or bubble events, if you want to call them that. Um, and I think we might be in that similar position once the, the present situation changes and we start seeing businesses reopening. 
yeah, I, I think we we almost know how it's going to happen, really, don't we? We, it's, we, we we've seen the we've seen the training run or whatever last year. Yeah. So, John identified the vaccination is you know going to push us forward. Um, older people like me might be given the vaccination, but if I'm taking younger groups out on the water, they may not have had it. So you've got that to consider as well. So yeah, although it's positive, there are some some hurdles to jump through still. Well, yes, and I think that's been the big discussion today: is do do we open up just with those who've been vaccinated? And we, we let them kickstart the economy, or do we wait for everyone? There's uh, some interesting dialogues going on on that. <laughs> and I think, uh, well, John, you've got some experience with Israel. I think they, they're they going down that route, aren't they? Yeah, well, I think they probably outbid the UK to get the uh, supply of vaccines, I guess. Well, I think they've got the supply of vaccines, but they're talking about releasing their economy to those who've been vaccinated. You know. Yeah, I mean, that do, that does make sense. I mean, I think the herd immunity, you need a very large percentage of the population um, before we're, you know, over over the worst of it. And I hope, you know, people will have faith in the, in the science. Um, you know, Tudor actually does a lot of studying um, with her degree and people who've studied for years and years and years to work on these these projects okay. and when you jump in an aeroplane you know you don't really think that much about the aeroplane which does have a, a very small amount of risk you just trust the pilot knows what he's doing and I think it's the same analogy for the for the vaccine and you know some of the the conspiracies I've been around you know they just made me laugh you know nobody's going to stick a needle and keep it in there because you'll be like well wait <laughs> what, what are you doing <laughs> somebody would have reported that yeah 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 <laughs> But uh, also good. Right, okay, so uh, moving on. Let's just uh, be it. So, um, obviously, we've been busy on the restart sailing front. We've now booked a stand at the virtual dinghy show. <laughs> so, uh, that'll be interesting to sort of uh, see. But the RAA obviously pushing ahead with this. The, the RAA, I think, have been doing some good stuff on virtual conferences and things like that. I don't know if you're involved, John, with the other uh, race officers conference last week, I think? Uh, yes, you were, uh, very you much so. Saw, saw you there. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how much I was going to be able to do sailing-wise, so I booked up every online event that I could. Yeah, but what's interesting about those online events, I mean, I've been to, I don't know you, John, to the real versions, but there's much more interaction going on, I think, online than you do normally at the, the physical gatherings. I think people are just more used to online meetings now and we're all better at them. Yeah, yeah. And there's some good comments coming out, I saw, you know, in terms of uh, people looking for ideas for the future. And I think it's uh, these these virtual platforms are very good at engaging with people. <laughs> yeah, well, I think people, people are just more used to it now. Um, and I, I also think that this is another one of the positive things which will hopefully carry on in the future. Well, yes, we, we talked about virtual AGMs, haven't we, and things like that, and online briefings, you know. Let's hope they don't get abandoned by, uh, by the onset of uh, being able to gather. You know, I think uh, they can be so much more efficient. Certainly the online briefing is much more efficient of doing it ahead of the, uh, the race day, isn't it? I think, Simon, why you mentioned the AGMs is a prime example, yeah. where as a group of um, been running Zoom AGMs, for for many years um introduced probably about four years ago so you get a, a nucleus of people turning up at the event but the majority from around the country are still partaking and i think yeah. the only way you push this forward is using media to actually promote how the, the industry is working um, well well no exactly it's, it's, it sounds like you've been pioneering that i know for sailing clubs uh, the virtual agm was uh, frowned upon wasn't it a bit john in terms of uh, not how we do it but it's uh, apparently they've had massive attendance the ones yeah that i think one of the things is human nature is just resistant to change yeah um for whatever reason um but actually progress is just a a fact of life so i as i said i think lots of good things will will come out of this but you know it's a pretty dark lockdown at the moment my my phone is you know always going off with the possibility of us you know going into into phase four here and i think we we need to take the skills forward that we that we learn yeah yeah and be, be positive about it and that we, we you know we, we have made some progress but uh and yeah, yeah good to see the rwa keeping keeping with the dinghy show i mean it would have been easier just to effectively abandoned it until uh until next year and these sort of gatherings are important again from the trade point of view Ian, i think aren't they in terms of giving the vehicle for for people to pr present their wares <laughs> I think you're right. If, if you've only got to look back at, you know, seven-year-old sailing the dinghy and racing, learn my skills. 
uh, up to where I am now working uh, in the industry, if you haven't got the stepping stones, you'll never get to the, the backup and the, the, the people in the industry. Yeah. I think majority suddenly see a wonderful place to work. Uh, and I think the stepping stone is those smaller boats to start with. Well, that's right. And we, and we, but we need these dinghy shows. We need these yeah. sort of gatherings, you know, and uh, we've lost the, uh, we well, lost the London boat show some time ago, didn't we? But uh, we've obviously uh, lost the Southampton one, hopefully temporarily. We've lost uh, Dusseldorf, which I guess was the biggest, wasn't it? I think the boat shows. And uh, if there's an industry and a sport and a leisure activity, if we don't have these gatherings, we're not really anything, are we? Yeah, I mean, you saw NDL this year in one company that tried very hard to get some on-water exhibitions on the back end of Southampton being closed at short notice. Um, they were reasonably successful, I'm guessing, but it was a targeted, if you were interested in a princess or a, a particular yacht, you were invited along. You, It wasn't an open door policy. You had to be invited, but it, it opened the doors up to people to go and see the yachts and the cruisers and everything else. Yeah, I, I did actually think that idea of the, the the more local or more focused boat show actually has a lot of potential. I mean, you you see that a lot in France. I mean, I John's probably done, done events you know, like in La Rochelle. I remember doing the Olympic week there, and uh, there'd always be a boat show, wouldn't there, John? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, so taking the venue and actually, you know, you might have a big race going on. But why not put a little boat show in there? It all sort of uh, complements it. And that perhaps is the way forward, isn't it? Those more smaller regional focus events rather than the, the big, big, big batches. Well, we saw that we saw a drift away from that, didn't we, over the years from the Isle of Wight um, Cows Marina that would hold an event uh, to suddenly it got washed away. Um, so the smaller event. And I think they're coming back, as you rightfully say, as the marinas are beginning to think we need to get people back on the water. Well, yes, and it's a matter about, it's, it's about creating activity and entertainment almost, isn't it? And uh, why, why should you go to that marina? Well, okay, there's a boat show on, you might go there, or there's a race. And I think we, we sort of lost lost the plot a bit on that, didn't we, in the recent years? Yeah. So I think, so again, good good changes going and good good for the, uh, the RBA. So, um, Again, the area that yeah, we've got the Seldom Soldiers Winter Series, unfortunately, uh, under AP. Uh, not much we can do about that, but because... Uh, um, well, I mean, they cancelled the Youth Nationals in April, so I think that was probably, you know, uh, uh, showing a sign of things to come at the moment. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, and I think, uh, well, at, at the moment, although we can go sailing, there's no way we can race, is there, in this country, John, I think. No. Sort of, uh, so we we just need to sort of do it. Although we, we did show with the Datchet Flyer that we can you know, get hundreds of people sort of to an event in a COVID secure manner. So we are we are ready, but uh, basically we're we're under AP. But what we have been doing, um, Andy Rice and I, is uh, lots of uh, webinars, this sort of thing. So we did one on the the Bloody Mary, in as we mentioned, and uh, um, just just trying to make sure we do something. I think that's I think that's the message, isn't it? So, we should be perhaps going sailing, but we can't go sailing. But let's let's keep the engagement going and. Uh, it's been very encouraging. People say, well, that's actually kept me sane, hasn't it, John? We've had, had that quite a f familiar comment, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> In terms of, uh, you know, it's a bit of uh, someone to talk to and things like that. And I, I think, again, thank, thank heavens for technology. The social the, aspect. The social aspect, yeah. We, sailing and, you know, boating is a very social activity, but uh, we can't do it. But we can at least sort of... Uh, simulate it can't we in terms of have these sort of gatherings i think uh, hopefully we've learned some things i think this sort of concept will carry on won't it in terms of uh, that sort of yeah again those, those, those meetings will still happen online yeah i, th I think you're right so the the social media side of things has obviously risen considerably um and i think we need to make sure that people are joining in with it um whether it's a private group or whether it's a public group it gives the opportunity open to everyone to join in uh, it's there if you look for it. Yeah, I think that's it, and I think that's in a way that that's the power of social media. Social media's got a lot of problems, as we know, but uh, that engagement and community is, is a real strength of it. And I think, uh, as a sport and a body, you know, we, we need to make sure we use it. And I think I think we are. I think there's some good stuff going on, as we see. Right, and uh, so in terms of our dates, well, we're still sort of <laughs> moving around. I suspect these will sort of change. Um, we're running out of winter, but we might carry on to the summer. <laughs> so we might actually class with next winter series. You never know. So interestingly, it's not up here, but the, the Tiger Trophy was due to be happening in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, that's now been scheduled to the end of August. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be in the winter series. I need to speak to Andy about that, but it could well be. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah, at what point do you change the cutoff? Do you change the cutoff after June and then it becomes 21, 22? I don't know. I don't know. Interesting question. <laughs> we, Conversation for you and Andy, I think. Well, yeah, so we do, we do have a steering group of sort of uh, um, yeah, sailors with a vested interest to sort of give it. But uh, I think at the moment people are just keen to get out there. <laughs> Does it matter if it's the winter or summer? I think uh, they'll be keen to see some activity. And I suspect yeah. when, when things get unlocked, there will be, as we've seen, a massive demand will come back, won't it? The, Certainly the national championships that happened, John, were, were massively oversubscribed, weren't they? Absolutely. And I think the Sail GP are back with you? Um, they're back in, well, I think they're due to come to Plymouth, aren't they? I think that's sort of... Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's April time as well. Well, yeah. Straight after the um, <laughs> America's Cup. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, that, 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 you know, it's really interesting to date, look for, isn't it, in terms of... Uh, but it's a small control group of elite, which is much more manageable. Yeah, yeah, and those sort of things will happen. And I think the message is with the football or whatever, the government realises the importance of some of these activities happening, don't they? You know, that's uh, the key difference. Football's happening, isn't it? And it wasn't happening in uh, the first lockdown in terms of uh, Premier League and elite football. <laughs> like, uh, they've they've recognised the importance of having some activity out there. Um, and I think, John, they've also recognised the importance of grassroots, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my... The slides, which we'll get to in a minute with the with the coaching, I mean, they they are the, the, the things, the conversations I have with the elite sailors, but they, they reply to absolutely everybody. And, and possibly, you know, especially the grassroots sailors just setting, oh my word, I can't believe there's a, there's a spelling mistake on another slide. This is this is what happens to show that A, it's live and, and B, I'm pretty busy. I thought, oh, I thought you'd create a new word there, John. But... No, no, no. Oh dear. But it, interestingly, it hasn't come up as a spelling mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of a smart goal, uh, just in case anyone worries that, is absolutely universal. I mean, uh, during normal times, we're all incredibly busy um, and we want to be as successful as we can. And it's really difficult when you have um, a very vague goal. So if somebody said to me, I want to be faster, well, that's what we all want. We all want to be faster all the way around the race course. And you spend your life achieving that. And the highest level sailors in the world are still trying to do that. But actually to be specific and to work on a weakness is, is really going to help you. So if it's sailing upwind in over 25 knots and a short choppy sea state, that's really specific. So that's something that you can work on. Whereas if you just say I want to go upwind faster, again, that's not uh, such a good goal. OK. Yes, but I, I think perhaps we're seeing more of this in the, the grassroots aren't we that people perhaps who wouldn't have had goals are now having goals aren't they I think. <laughs> hello john are you still there because then oh you're coming and going john <laughs> yeah you see the the joys of the internet and you need to have uh the measured goals um and you can record them and then you have that that sense of achievement when you've done it um, and then you can actually move on to, a, to another goal. And part of the measuring process is you just need to know when the goal's done and you have done what you set out to do. So, you know, some goals are very easy in terms of improving your strength or fitness. And we've talked about that. Uh, other goals uh, like doing good mark roundings or boat handling skills, it's, it's harder. And these goals have to be agreed. And I say that not, not only if you're on a two man boat, <laughs> but maybe you have to agree with, with other, other halves or a bank manager or um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the crew or other support team. Uh, because if one half of you wants to do one thing and the other half wants to do another, it's not really going to work. And it, it goes down into that recording, the, uh, the, the agreement, because uh, you need to be realistic. And that's very much linked to the time. So how much improvement you can expect in three weeks is very different to three months is very different to three years. So that the timed aspect is very important. And the thing about a realistic goal, you know, something which is highly unrealistic in three days time may be too easy in three years time or vice versa. So by being realistic, it's got to be something you have to work for. You're going to be happy to achieve. Um, but if you set the bar too high or, or too low, uh, that's, that's not good. Uh, you need that challenge and that, that success without uh, setting yourself up for failure. So that's your, that's your smart gold. 
just <laughs> a new coaching word. <laughs> right. But just to show dyslexic can mm. can be can be coaches. There you go. Yeah. I think there's secretly quite a few of us um, at the at the front, uh, both sort of coaches and, and sailors and and so on. But uh, I will do my homework better for the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That, I, I did I did wonder, John, but interestingly, the, the spell checker didn't didn't pick it up. So it must be a word. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it means. <laughs> want to uh, want to look about? Hopefully afterwards. not something rude. Somebody <laughs> will tell me after the show. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So uh, show twenty one <laughs> into February. Yeah, I'm amazed. It, the time just seems to be flying away. Uh, something else seems to have gone wrong with my slide. Oh dear, yeah, that looks a bit strange. Gone off uh, the screen. But basically, a bit. <laughs> there's two uh, there's two times now of live seven and nine o'clock, and uh, my internet doesn't seem very friendly today, so it might not be bang on nine, but we're <laughs> We do our best and YouTube actually works very well. If you uh, subscribe, you get a notification just like you do for Facebook. Uh, but if you want to look, look at consecutive videos, it does link similar videos together very well. Yeah. And uh, for when people are back traveling, uh, I often have uh, YouTube in the background to make the time pass a bit quicker. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I guess in, in two weeks, we're probably having a similar show in terms of uh, talking about what may be happening, John. I think. Uh, well, we're uh, going to be really well prepared for when we can get on the water. And I will have some top tips every show um, and maybe even a, a working spell checker. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, I think it's said that the message is that, you know, we are prepared. <laughs> the, the, the marine industry is, is ready to come. We just need to be given that release. OK, well, uh, thank you very much, Ian. <laughs> Good to have you, and uh, we will see everyone in a couple of weeks' time. Certainly, Bob. Okay. Thanks, Okay, bye-bye.